Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Leaders and Learners, where we know that the best leaders are lifetime learners. They're always seeking new ways to improve quality of life, to improve in their career, to help others. Um, and today we have a pretty dope person to talk to you about, listen, leadership. You know that's my thing, right? Being a leader, learning how to lead others, whether it's from the back, the front, or the middle, having the ability to communicate, to get others to understand you, to get others to follow you, and trust you. How do you get people to know, like, and trust you in a way that allows for you to stand out as a leader? A lot of that shows up in your career. How is that working out for you? I have someone here today that wrote a book called 101 Ways to Find Work and Keep Finding Work for the Rest of Your Career. Now, listen, we're in times right now where people are struggling to find a job, find the right job, find the right opportunity, build their career. He was also a TEDx speaker. So for any of you out there that have been trying to figure it out and crack the code on becoming a TEDx speaker, what it takes, what are some of the thought leadership components to that? Today, I'm bringing them to you. So without further ado, let's talk to Dr. Chaz. How you doing, sir? I'm fine, Tanya. Good to see you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know you're busy because there's a lot of people in the world that need what you're offering. So let's go ahead and jump into your story and how you got where you are. Why this? Like, of all the things you could be doing with your body of work, why this? I became a college professor about 20 years ago, and I'm a, I'm a good utility player. I've taught over 60 courses in my career, everything from criminology to the history of rock and roll. Uh, but as a college professor, I got to see there was something missing, that we were preparing people to graduate, but not preparing them for the working world. Uh, this was also true when I went to college. So it hadn't changed. And I saw a need here to actually prepare people in how to navigate uh, the working world. Um, and that became particularly relevant as we moved into, into the gig economy. So what I teach people to do is to self-market. Um, and you're right. I this is work. I'll have work as long as I want to work because it's such a sweet spot. People are so flipped out, nervous, anxious about the future of the working world and their future and their careers. Um, and I help guide them. And I've been very successful doing it. So um, I'm feeling a, a real need for people. You know, it's interesting what you do um, and how you get people to recognize even the most educated individuals still have to do some essential things to be able to propel themselves in their careers, right? Yes. So you can have a thousand different degrees. We have friends with tons of degrees and can't find a job. We have friends with all the education in the world and can't keep a job. How do you communicate that to people that seem to struggle with that? Because before you can teach someone how to do something, you have to show them where maybe they, they're going wrong. It's like pulling teeth. People do, I'm, I'm training them for the 21st century. And most people still live in the 20th century. I have an education, I have a degree, I have a cover letter, I know how to interview, I deserve a job. Well, the jobs are going away. Uh, the, the classic, I work for a company for 40 years and, and uh, retire with a pension, that's what our parents and grandparents had. That no longer exists. Companies don't want to pay benefits. Um, so you you have to approach it in an entirely different way. So what I do is change how people think and then train them on how to behave differently, to basically behave as a freelancer uh, or your own business as your own brand. And People are so resistant. I don't want to. I don't want to. And my answer is, I don't care. These are necessary skills for the 21st century. You sound like me. I didn't ask you. I didn't ask. I'm telling you. And you got to do that sometimes. So how did you get here? What? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where did you go to school at? 
A oh, little little background about me. I grew up in Manhattan, uh, not Manhattan Beach, Manhattan. Uh, I, I attended the High School of Music and Art, the City College of New York. Uh, after my folks died, I was a, an only child. Uh, I moved to the West Coast. I got my master's in radio and television uh, from San Francisco State University. And then you go where the work is. And if I wanted to work in network television production, which is what I did, you got to move to L.A. So I did. I've been here ever since. Um, and I worked. I've, I'm atypical for baby boomers. Millennials will have seven or eight careers. I've had seven or eight careers. Uh, one of them was a television producer for um, the CBS network and the ABC owned and operated stations. I produced promos for them and I worked for Dick Clark. And then I, I morphed into uh, the video business and then I saw digital media coming uh, in the early 90s and moved over there and then became a professor. So it's a, it's a gradual sort of growth, um, incremental growth to get where I am now. Dick Clark, tell me about that. What was that experience like? Um, <laughs> he was a genius in what I call vanilla television. Mm. Um, and there was, in a sense, there were, there were two Dicks. One was the public, Dick Clark, uh, and people used to say, gee, he seems like such a nice man. Yeah, on camera. But uh, if you worked for him, uh, and I have to tread carefully because he's dead now. Um, if you work for him, he was like a six-year-old on speed. He had 10 different shows and projects in his head, and you were supposed to follow what he was talking about. And if you didn't, he'd yell at you. He was kind of a typical Hollywood screamer. Uh, but I sat up with him in editing rooms at four, till 4.30 in the morning. And what an education to learn from this guy how to make television. But I left TV because I was making vanilla television. And that's not why I got a master's degree, to make uh, the the my three sons partridge family thanksgiving reunion show when you're a little embarrassed about what you're doing it's time to go and do something else <laughs> vanilla television now let's get into that a little bit and how do you think that that has changed or has it um I, television's changed enormously our media consumption has changed enormously i i remember when i i worked at Pepperdine University. I was the manager of the MBA program, the career program in the MBA school there. And the director of marketing came up to me one day and said, uh, we want to target our uh, degree programs to millennials. What radio stations do they listen to? And I thought for a second and I said, they don't. She said, oh, you're right. They don't. Media habits have shifted. Watching TV the way people did 20, 30 years ago, that no longer exists. We're watching TikTok. I'm watching TikTok. Yeah, I, I can do, you know, 10 second sound bites, but a long program, no. And I have learned to despise commercials. So I watch a lot of streaming shows and movies where there are no commercials and happy to pay for them. So uh, it's a it's a completely different world. It is. It is. So you went from entertainment to in entertaining yourself with other people's issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also played I also played the drums when I was young for about 15 years. I don't call myself a drummer. I played the drums. Um, and at a certain point, I said, am I going to turn professional? And I realized if I was really dedicated, I would need to practice like eight hours a day. And I liked it, but not that much. Right. So as I say, I had I lacked two things or I would have been Paul McCartney. The two things I lacked were talent and drive. <laughs> so I left it to somebody else who really was uh, committed to that. So now I certainly enjoy music and I I I play um, I play Spotify, but I don't play an instrument, really. Um, and I'm fine with that. You've got to know what you're good at and focus on that and everything else becomes a hobby. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. So you do this coaching thing. What is the difference between coaching and consulting? And do you find yourself doing both? Um, they're spelled differently. I don't see, I don't see a real distinction between them. Yeah. Um, we can call it, I call myself a career trainer. It's training, it's coaching, it's consulting. 
uh, you, you could say all of them fall under the, the uh, heading of I don't work full time for someone except myself. So these are clients or students when I teach courses on how to self-market, which I have done for years and years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very good. So where, who are your ideal clients and where are you finding them right now? I, ideal client is the same as uh, an ideal leader, someone who listens. <laughs> you, uh, you know, the, the, to, to paraphrase that old line, um, a coach is a terrible thing to waste. If I have a coach and someone's coaching me, I have a personal trainer, for example. My job is to shut up and do what I'm told. And uh, I don't get to vote. I'm paying him to tell me what I need to do. And my job is to take those actions. Um, same thing with a good client is a client who uh, will be open and listen and do what I tell them. Um, and be willing to break themselves up and sometimes actually transform themselves in how they behave, how they listen, how they deal as leaders with their employees and, just, you know, stop being a bully and listen to other people. Because, uh, you know, Steve Jobs said you, you want to surround yourself with people smarter than you as your employees. And then your job as a leader is to listen to them and use the team that you've assembled uh, to make you a better uh, leader and uh, impact the organization that you're leading. I love that. So where is your biggest challenge? Where do you find yourself struggling to communicate those elements and ideas to your clients? Like where, where, when you're having a hard time getting it to click for them, the things that you are trying to convey? <laughs> I had a, someone I knew who had led a company and I, when I was getting my doctorate, my doctorate's from Pepperdine, uh, it's in organizational leadership. Um, and I told him that we had dinner once and he said, um, oh yeah, I, I'm a leader and my job is they do what I tell them to. So the struggle is dealing with that old fashioned, I'm the daddy and you have to suck up to me or I'm going to, you know, fire you. And there's always that threat that if I don't do everything I'm told to do, my boss is going to fire me because I said the wrong thing or wore the wrong outfit or something. They can fire me for any reason. Um, so I have to kind of cheer down the, uh, the desire. And it's, a, it's not just a desire, but it's, it's behaviors that have been ingrained in us for decades and centuries that if I'm the boss, I'm the daddy, and everybody does what I tell them to. That's not collaborative leadership, uh, nor does it get you the best results because your people are living in fear and they don't feel safe and they're going to do what you what they think you want them to do and say what you think you want they want them you you want them to say uh, instead of having a safe environment where uh, they're open and you're open to fresh ideas. I have a, a, a piece I wrote uh, on how to lead and manage people. And the last line in it says, a great leader is a gardener. He or she creates a safe environment for their people and protects and nurtures that environment so they can grow and flourish. And that's, I wouldn't call it a frustration, but certainly a challenge. Uh, to get people who are traditionally trained, and it's mostly men, in being leaders, that that's not the most effective way to lead people. Wow. Okay. I Listen, much respect. Um, clearly, you do something that helps you continue to grow also. And I think that's important in this type of business is you're not closed off to new and different ways to teach and to educate and to communicate to others. So, you know, yeah. being open helps both parties, right? Yeah, you, you're always about, or I'm always about uh, being open to new ideas myself. I don't, certainly don't have all the answers. Um, and I think that's, that's what's critical as you, to be more effective, to always be open to new ideas, to get them from anywhere you can or anyone you can. Yeah. Now tell me about the book. Um, talk to me about why, with everything else that you've done, you decided to write the book and then, you know, who is it for? Who's the best person to read this book? Who's your target audience? Um, anyone who, <laughs> it's almost anyone. Um, it's anyone who's looking for a job or recareering. 
So it's people in high school, graduating high school, all the way to uh, seniors who say, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be retired from this company, but I still have more to offer and more to contribute. Um, and where do I go from here? So a lot of my clients and my students uh, are people who are older, who have a lot left in them, but don't quite know which direction to go in. How do I, how do I find a job after 60? Who will hire me? That sort of thing. So it's, it's anyone uh, interested in continuing to work. I guess that's the audience. And why did you decide to write a book? Because that ain't easy either now. Um, it's part of it was credibility. Part of it was I just had some things to say that I think people need to know. This grew out of my doctoral dissertation, which is uh, I want to have my coursework embedded in college curriculums mm. as a mandatory program. So whatever your major is, I know you studied sociology, whatever your major is, so you're getting a degree in sociology at the same time, mandatory. You're taking courses in how to monetize what you've learned so you can make an impact on the world. This is not about, oh, look, I have a piece of paper. I have a bachelor's in sociology. That's nice. And probably a hundred thousand dollars in debt. We'll put that aside. But um, I have a piece of paper. Let's go. What are you going to do with this piece of paper? What is it for? How are you going to make a positive impact on the world and make a difference in people's lives using that degree? That's what that's for. And that's what that's what very much my work is about from a foundational sense is how do you make a contribution to the world? How do you be of service to the world, given your gifts, given your education, anything else you can offer? Awesome. Um, do you have a passage that you could read uh, from sure. the book? Because yes. I'd love for our listeners to be able to get a sense of what this piece of literature can do for them and how sure. it resonates. Sure. I'll read, I'll do just a couple of paragraphs from the first chapter. There's a sign in my office that says, welcome to the tough love dispensary. Well, reader, welcome to my office in book form. 101 ways to find work is straight talk on how to deal with the working world the way it really is, not how we'd like it to be. As a career mentor and educator who's dedicated to preparing my clients to be successful, to supporting and empowering them to make their dreams come true, I can do no less. There are things in this book that you may not, that you may not want to hear, but I believe you need to hear or more accurately read. Whatever your vocational goals, whatever stage you are in your career, whether it's just beginning or you're close to retiring, but you can't afford to stop making money, this book will help you get from here to there, turning your dreams and fantasies into actions and results. I like that. It's a definite um, call to action. So Yes, and, and that's what I teach or when I work with my clients. I just finished teaching a course uh, yesterday, another course, and um, I tell people I'm only interested in action and results. If you want theory, you're in the wrong room. I don't do theory. Everything I teach you and train you in is something that is relevant, valuable, and you can use not just to find the next job, but for the rest of your life, no matter what you do, whether you have, you'll have different careers or you actually start your own business, these are principles and behaviors that will always be valuable to you, that will always help sustain you in contributing to the world. I like what you said about teaching people how to monetize that piece of paper, right? Or even if you don't have a degree, how do you monetize your skills? How do you monetize your knowledge? Yeah. And, and what I have them do, this is unusual. Um, I, the, the, what I, where I've been teaching for the most part is through uh, Los Angeles Pierce College in the adult education uh, department. And I've been teaching a course that I designed. This book is the textbook for the course um, on how to monetize whatever it is you have. And what I use, which is unusual, uh, I use a SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which businesses use when they want to expand. Uh, my assertion is people are now in the gig economy, their own business. So I have them use the SWOT analysis on themselves. And the top left quadrant is strengths. What specific skills do you have 
that people will pay for in your industry or in the industry you want to go into. Um, and this is, it again, like pulling teeth. It's tough for people because they undervalue themselves and don't see or don't understand their connection and their skill set to the marketplace. But it really is about what can you do that someone will pay you for and how do you upskill over time so that uh, you know the latest version of or the brand new software program that they're using in your industry. And if you knew that, then uh, you could make more money and be of more value to people that you work with. So what do you say to people that, you know, we're in the gig economy, but everyone is a creative now. Um, you know, no one wants to go back into the office. Uh, everyone wants to follow their passion. So you're right. We're in a totally different age. So the way that we used to monetize our skills in that piece of paper have changed. What is yeah. the biggest change that you've seen? And yeah. how do you, for people that are kind of huh, fluffy and <laughs> kind of <laughs> in their heads about what their skills are, because you'd still need some hard skills. I mean, there's yeah. soft skills, right? But you yeah, need but to be able no, to What will I pay you for? And I have them get very specific. I'm, I'm tough taskmaster. But what people specific? don't know that. They, no, they really no. don't know what people will pay them for. My courses, if anybody lives in the West Valley in Los Angeles, the courses are free. We get a grant. Pierce College gets a grant from the state and the courses are free. And I, I always tell them that's my final offer. Free. You're not working. It's a couple of days. It's 12 hours. The first course, the second follow up course is 36. Also free. Um, let me introduce a concept here that directly addresses what you asked, Kanya, which is the concept of monetizable passion. So you may love doing something, but if you can't make a living at it, it's a hobby. And you want to understand the distinction that you can still be of service to people and not have it be the, the thing I've been me I've meant to do my whole life. Like if you want to be a painter, yeah? So uh, maybe you can find a job teaching painting uh, or tutoring people on painting or doing some graphic design. And then the oil painting that you like to do the work you do will pay for that, but you want to focus on monetizable passion. Many of the concepts, including that one, are mind blowers for people. It's like, what, what is that? I've never heard of that. Very upsetting. Okay. I'm a brand. I have to sell myself. I have to self-market. I have to look at monetizable passion. I have to network. I have to be good with social media. Ah, I just came here to get a job. Sorry, not my job, your job. Okay, but in the 21st century, these are this is the new skill set that you'll need. And when we work on the top left quadrant, your strengths, I want to know what software programs, you know, I want to know what accomplishments you've had, um, what languages you speak. It's not me knowing it. It's the people who could potentially hire you want to know this. That's what they will pay for. They're not going to pay for I work hard and I'm a good team player. <laughs> I don't, my job description doesn't include that. This is what I need. Can you do that? And they start to think and behave in a different way. One of my students called it a paradigm shift. And it's very hard for people to get out of the old ways that they're used to and, and being called on to self-market when they never had to do that before. Um, and I tell them, I don't care if you're good at it. I just want you to be good enough so you keep getting work. You have enough of a network. The, 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 the structure is define, articulate, and sell your brand. What's your brand? How do you articulate it and communicate it to people who will pay for what you have? And then you sell your whole life. Once you're dead, you're off the hook. But as long as you want to work, you're selling. Yeah. So they hate it. I don't care. I want them working. I want them always working. And they always can this way. I've had enormous success with this. And people at first hate it. And then they go, you know, this is great. This really works. This is the new way. I didn't see this before. Thank you. And they, they, they're they much very much appreciated. So it's uh, very gratifying to be able to do that for clients. Well, I appreciate you spending time with us today. Um, I appreciate you sharing your philosophy, your thought leadership, and how you are helping people just live a better life because people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. right? That's what it comes down to. You don't know what you don't know. So then you get someone like him that can help you know it. Yeah. So I want to thank you for that and let the people know how they can stay in touch with you, how they can um, 
hook up with you and get, <laughs> get some get some get right um, in their career because these days I think that's what they need. Yeah. Thanks. Best way uh, is through my LinkedIn profile. Uh, it's Dr. Chaz Austin, C H A Z A U S T I N, like the capital of Texas. Uh, I'm, I'm at the point now I have over 32,000 followers and LinkedIn has a rule. Once you hit 30,000, no more connections. You have to follow me. So I, I invite anyone who would like to, to please follow me. I, uh, my life is about contributing to other people. So I post things regularly. I post things about courses and podcasts, et cetera, um, just to help the people that are in my network to navigate the 21st century workplace. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here and we will stay in touch. Yeah. Very good. Absolutely, Tonya. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, you guys. He, he laced you with a lot of good information, a lot of opportunities to increase your own value, your own worth, your own ability to sell yourself. And for me, you know, that's PR. That's really understanding how public relations, personal public relations work. How do you sell yourself? How do you tell your own story? How do you be your own best cheerleader? You have to know and love who you are and what you have to offer in a way that you can speak to it so it resonates with others. You have to understand what those hard skills are that you have to offer a company so that they will want to bring you on and make you a part of their culture, a part of their organization. All of this is important. All of this is something that he can help you with. All of it is something that I totally champion. So being a leader, understanding how to tell your story. And I promise you, if you hook up with this guy, you'll be better than you were before you started. And that's what this is about. Learning how to be a leader, a lifetime learner, continuously improving, growing your network and growing your net worth. You guys, I'll see you soon. Take it easy. I'll see you back here next time.